Normally, I don't read an entire uh, bio, but um, Dr. Hotez's is very impressive, and I really want you to uh, get a sense of just who, who it is that we're going to hear from tonight. Um, Peter Hotez, MD, PhD, is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, where he is also the Texas Children's Hospital's Endowed Chair of Tropical Pediatrics. He is also the University Professor at Baylor University and Fellow in Disease and Poverty at the James Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. He is an internationally recognized physician scientist in neglected tropical diseases and vaccine development, and, and he actually is involved in producing vaccines, um, which he'll talk about tonight. He leads the only product development partnership for developing new vaccines for hookworm infection, um, Schistos, how do you pronounce that? Schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis. Schist I'm a political scientist, not a doctor. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Chagas disease and SARS MERS disease uh, affecting hundreds of millions of children and adults worldwide. Um, he received in 2006 the, the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, helped him co found the Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases to provide access to essential medicines for hundreds of millions of people. He has a, his a undergraduate degree is in molecular biophysics from Yale University. He has a PhD MD from uh, the Rockefeller University, MD from uh, Cornell University. Um, he author, has authored more than 400 original papers and is the author of uh, the acclaimed book Forgotten People, Forgotten Diseases and the recently released Blue Marble Health, an innovative plan to fight diseases of the poor amid wealth. He uh, taught at, at Yale University for 11 years and also at George Washington University for 11 years where he chaired the, uh, the uh, microbiology department at George Washington. Uh, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and in 2011, he was awarded the Abraham Horowitz Award for Excellence in Leadership and Inter-American Health by the Pan-American Health Organization of the World Health Organization. Um, he was appointed by, the, uh, by President Obama as U.S. State Department um, uh, envoy, uh, for, uh, as a science envoy, um, in, in conducting what he calls science diplomacy, basically going around uh, parts of the Middle East, uh, helping uh, various Middle Eastern countries develop the capacity to uh, to build vaccines. Um, and so he's done a lot of different things around the world. Um, finally, uh, I, I, I'm just very, very uh, excited about this. Um, uh, uh, a lot of things that have been in the news lately, um, Dr. Hotez has been involved with. Um, he emerged as a major national thought leader on the Zika academic in, in the Western Hemisphere. He was among the very first to predict Zika's emergence in the United States, and he has called upon frequently to testify before Congress, and he served on infectious disease tax forces um, for two, tex two consecutive Texas governors. Um, he's been on CNN and BBC, Fox News, MSNBC. After the hurricane hit Houston, Texas, he was on, on CNN um, not that long ago uh, talking about frankly, uh, tropical diseases in Houston um, in response to all of this. Um, and then finally, uh, I would say that, um, and this is part of his bio, um, as, as, a, as a, a, a dad of an, of an autistic child, um, he is a major advocate around the country for vaccines. Um, and he's a major speaker uh, against the anti-vaccine um, people um, who, are, who are trying to debunk science. And I, I think that's something that I, I really appreciate in particular. Um, it is really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Hotez. Please give him a, a warm welcome. I'm going to not stand behind the podium because I've learned over the years as somebody in my stature, when you stand behind the podium, all you see is podium. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of try to be out front and, and try to be a, a little bit uh, interactive. First of all, thank you for coming out on a cold night, although I guess for you, this is not so cold. This is, uh, this is springtime already. So, um, so what I'd like to do if we can is, uh, when, if, whenever possible, I know it's a pretty big group, but if we can kind of keep this interactive, so I'll try to ask you questions from time to time and feel free to interrupt asking questions, make it, rather than my just lecturing to you like a traditional lecture, try to make it more of a discussion. I think it'll be uh, a little bit more fun uh, and, and entertaining uh, this evening. So I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna start here with something called the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Now, probably a lot of the global studies students know what the MDGs are, but what happened was in the year 2000, 
the director, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, what he did was he brought all global leaders to United Nations headquarters to deal with the plight of a group called the Bottom Billion. Anybody ever hear that term? Anybody want to, and maybe some of the students want to say who the bottom billion are? Don't be shy. I'm going to make you less shy by the end of the evening. It refers to the fact that there, at that time, there were a billion people in the world that live on no money, that lived below the World Bank poverty figure of, a, of less than a dollar a day. Uh, global leaders were brought to United Nations headquarters to say, okay, what are we going to do about the billion people that live on no money? And what was really important about this effort, based in New York at the United Nations, was for the first time, people actually linked disease to poverty. That is... Disease was not only a health problem, it was an economic problem because it made two people too sick to go to work or it interfere, interfere with pregnancy outcome. So that part of the solution of lifting people out of poverty and saving the bottom billion was to address their diseases. And there was a particular Millennium Development Goal, number six. So these are the goals on the right there. Some of them are pretty obvious to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, reduce child mortality. Uh, so, so there was this uh, b a big effort to really lift people out of poverty through also dealing with health. And number six was a, a especially an interesting one because it was called uh, to combat uh, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And this is what uh, created some enormous U.S. government initiatives. So this was around the year 2000. Who was president in the year 2000? George W. Bush. So he launched what was, what was called PEPFAR. P-E-P-F-A-R. stood for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Anybody know what PEPFAR is funded to right now? Since you're paying for it? It's about $8 billion a year. So $8 billion a year of government support is going to put the poorest people in Africa and Asia and elsewhere onto antiretroviral drugs to treat their HIV AIDS as a way to prevent their, their AIDS. It's also what led to the president's malaria initiative to put people on anti-malarial drugs and bed nets. So, and something called the Global Fund to fight AIDS, to add tuberculosis and malaria. So this makes massive initiatives of billions of billions of dollars to actually treat infectious diseases as a way to make people feel better, make them more productive, and, and lift them out of poverty. And now as a result of that, uh, we saw big declines in the uh, global rates of HIV AIDS, of malaria. No question that it's been having a huge impact over the last 17, 18 years since the launch of the Millennium Development Goals. But, but I didn't come here to talk about AIDS or malaria. I came to talk about a third uh, component, uh, which is there's a third component to that Millennium Development Goal number six. Somebody tell me what it is. Other diseases. Boy, didn't that get a lot of people excited. Uh, so this, was, this became the problem. The problem was, you know, when the Millennium Development Goal number six was launched. This is when Bill and Melinda Gates started the Gates Foundation. It's what launched Brad Pitt to do a four-part series on AIDS and malaria. And back then, not so much now. If you got Brad, you also got Angie is at the same time. And uh, they could, it brought Bono into dealing with HIV. It's it created a buzz. It got a lot of people excited. But believe it or not, nobody decided to stand up there and say, other diseases, right? So, so we were kind of, and, and those of us like myself who, who worked on other diseases realized that we were on the outside looking in of this big, massive uh, global health uh, movement. And in, in response to that, uh, uh, those of us who worked on other diseases brought to get, got together, and, I, and especially myself and two colleagues from the United Kingdom, David Molyneux from Liverpool and Alan Fennick at Imperial College London, we went and did a branding exercise. We actually made up a term called neglected tropical diseases. And I'm going to show you the list in a minute. But it refers to the fact that beyond AIDS and malaria, there's a 
thousand or so diseases which are widespread among the poor and they cause they cause a chronic and disabling condition that makes people too sick to go to work shaves iq points off of kids interferes with pregnancy outcome and we felt these other diseases which we called ntds or neglected tropical diseases were the real stealth reason why the bottom billion could not escape out of poverty so i got very excited about this <clears throat> this branding opportunity and uh, even wrote a book about it, um, which my kids would call Dad's Forgotten Book on Forgotten People uh, with Forgotten Diseases. But it went into its second edition, thank you, and it got uh, translated uh, into Japanese. So the common features of them, they're highly endemic in rural areas of low-income countries. They tend to be ancient afflictions. They're chronic conditions. What does chronic mean? That's right, people uh, have them for long periods of time. Uh, oftentimes their whole life, they're highly disabling. And they're also, a lot of them are disfiguring, they're very stigmatizing. Uh, and, uh, and the common feature of those, they actually help uh, promote uh, poverty. And this is an example of one of those diseases. Um, this is called lymphatic phyloriasis. It's one of the most common neglected tropical diseases, otherwise called elephantiasis. How many people have heard of it? So a few of you have heard of it. This is not a rare disease. This affects about 30 million people uh, living in poor countries. Now, this individual, when he has it, he says it's quite a problem for me when I have to stand at work for long periods. So he's too sick to go to work to help support his family. And by that mechanism, India loses a billion dollars every year in economic productivity uh, from this disease. Now, one of the things this disease doesn't do is it doesn't kill. It disables, it disfigures, it makes you too sick to go to work, but it doesn't kill. Well, why is that important? Well, when you're talking to policymakers, policymakers want quick sound bites, right? They want to know how many people are dying or, you know, some quick number like that. Or when you heard about Ebola, for instance, you want to know how many people were dying. Well, no one's dying here. So it, everyone in this room understands why this disease is important now, but you see it's not a 30-second UNICEF commercial. It takes time uh, to kind of uh, explain. Uh, here's another one that's called female genital schistosomiasis. How many people have heard of that one? So not too many. This is probably the most common gynecologic condition on the African continent. It affects 100 million girls and women on the African continent. It's caused by a parasite that produces uh, parasite eggs to be released in the genital mucosa and the cervix, the uterus, the lower genital tract. It's a cause of pain, bleeding, and stigma. And now it's been linked to a three to four fold increase in HIV AIDS because it creates ulcerative lesions in the female genital tract. Uh, this is probably Africa's most common condition of girls and women that, that nobody's ever heard of. So a lot of the effort went into trying to get people to care about them. And even though they're not necessarily killer diseases themselves, they're highly disfiguring, they're causing poverty, they're making two people too sick to go to work. So, so here's the newest list of the diseases. So here's, uh, we work with this big initiative with the Gates Foundation to actually measure the number of people who have these diseases. And I don't expect you to remember all the numbers. I just want you to be overwhelmed by the, by the numbers. I mean, look at these diseases such as ascariasis. 799 million people have ascariasis, which is an intestinal roundworm infection. Or hookworm disease, 450 million people. Or our friends just to somiasis, 189 million people, or lymphatic phyloriasis, 29 million people. It means that every single person on the planet living in extreme poverty has one of these diseases. Now, uh, remember we talked about the bottom billion, but if you start adding up these numbers, you realize they actually add up to more than a billion. So what is that telling you? Sort of a what am I thinking question. Somebody say it. Yeah, people have multiple diseases at the same time. People are polyparasitized. They have multiple infections all at the same time. So in response to that, um, and, and we, we started doing a closer investigation. One of the, and we came up with a lot of non-intuitive things. One of them is to find that these diseases are disproportionately affecting uh, Christian-majority countries. 
and I actually had to do a little diversion into this. And it's something I learned. I learned. I learned something, which was that at the turn of the 20th century, most of the world's Christians lived in North America and Europe. And somewhere about 10, 20 years ago or so, that that flipped. Today, most of the Christian majority populations of the world actually live in what's called the global south, meaning South America, Africa, uh, and Asia. And these are the diseases that are decimating these Christian majority populations, and particularly Catholic uh, Catholic populations uh, living in extreme poverty. So this is a message that we're very much trying to get across to the Vatican, uh, particularly with someone like Pope, Pope Francis, who's so uh, committed uh, to the plight of the poor. These are the diseases that are trapping people uh, in poverty. So what are we doing about this? Well, back in 2005, uh, together with my colleagues, we wrote a, a two back-to-back papers in the Public Library of Science where we uh, identified a package of medicines that could be donated by the major pharmaceutical companies that could be put together in a package and actually simultaneously treat five or the six of the most common neglected tropical diseases, including uh, hookworm infection, ascariasis, whipworm, trachoma, lymphatic filariasis, and onchocerciasis. And the medicines just had to be given once a year. They didn't have to be given by a health professional. They could be given by a school teacher or a community health worker. Uh, and we costed it out that because we were able to work with industry to get the medicines being donated, you factored out the cost of the medicines because they were making them for another purpose. So let me give you an example. So one of the medicines in the package is called Zithromax. How many of you have taken a Z-Pack or Zithromax in the last year? Anybody not take a Z-Pack or Zithromax in the last year? So, I mean, right, they're ubiquitous, right? What, what did you take it for? You took it for your ear infection, your strep throat. You took it for your sinusitis. It's made by Pfizer. Pfizer makes a gazillion dollars off of it every year. But it also works for a neglected tropical disease called trachoma. And Pfizer was willing to donate the medicine that they had made for another purpose to donate it for purposes of mass drug administration, mass treatment for trachoma. And the list of medicine goes on. And we identified these countries in the different colors there that could be beneficiaries of it and estimated that we could make a big impact on these diseases for 40 cents a person per year. So, and if you look at the cost on the upper left, are the cost of treatment for AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and here's this package of medicine called the Rapid Impact Package that could be delivered for 40 cents a person per year. So we had an amazing story to tell. We wrote these papers in 2005, more than 10 years ago. And then what? So what do you do now as an academic who's got a pretty good idea and writes a paper about it? What do we do in what do we do in academia? Why do we write those papers? So we can get funding, get a grant. And why do we get the grant? So we can write more papers, right? And why do we write the papers? So we can get another grant to write the papers. But this is not what we wanted to do. We wanted to actually implement this as a massive public health program. How do we do that? What 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 did we need? Policies. How do you how do you make policy? How do you do that? I didn't know either. <laughs> so, so I didn't know either. At this time, I was um, a professor. I was at George Washington University, which is just a few blocks from the White House. And I decided that the idea was so good that I would start going to the executive office building of the White House and the congressional office buildings to tell people about this hoping that I wouldn't get arrested, right? That, 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 that something would really happen. And, and it worked. We were able to convince Congress to appropriate uh, initially $15 million to, uh, for, uh, for, for the treatment of these diseases. How many people could we treat for $15 million? Yeah, about 40 million people, and, and, and that's actually what happened, and it built momentum. So why am I telling you this story? And then the International Business Times wrote the story about myself and my two colleagues, how three scientists marketed neglected tropical diseases and raised more than a billion dollars. It really was a marketing exercise. So why am I telling you the story? I'm telling you the story because as a young person, 
as a scientist, as a physician, or as a political scientist, do not underestimate your power that you have to make people affect change. If you have a good idea and you're passionate about and willing to work hard, uh, you can make a huge uh, difference uh, in the world. And we've uh, working with the Gates Foundation now, we've just measured the impact of that package. And this is where we're at. Since 2006, when the program really got going, we've seen about a 30 to 40% reduction in the prevalence of these diseases to the point where diseases like lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, we can actually envision one day eliminating them as a public health problem actually having them disappear. For other diseases like hookworm and schistosomiasis, they seem to keep coming back. So we don't think this is going to be the ultimate solution. But for the other diseases, we're making a, a huge uh, impact. So it's, it's really been really gratifying to see uh, what kind of reduction we've been seeing. Now the world has changed again. So this is, this is where we're at today. So we, we had this idea of a package. It's been going on now for more than a decade. This is where we're at today. We've got now a number of things happening. First of all, those Millennium Development Goals that I told you about with the other diseases, that just sunsetted last year. It sunsetted actually two years ago in 2016. We've now, the world has switched over from Millennium Development Goals to what are called the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've got a whole new set of global leaders present. We've got a new U.S. president. We've got a new UK Prime Minister, we've got a new World Health Organization Director General, a new UN General Secretary, and with that, the world has undergone a, a lot of shifts. Now, I don't know if, we're, if we can really say that things are so dramatic that we're in a new world order right now, but I think we're getting pretty close to that. What do I mean by new world order? Well, this is why you have Professor Atlas to, to tell you about it. it refers, this is, this is how, what I know about political science, Professor Atlas. Uh, I use the Wikipedia definition. Uh, the two new world orders been used to refer to any new period of history, evidencing a dramatic change in a world political thought and the balance of power. And it refers to things like the creation of the League of Nations after World War I, or the United Nations after World War II, or the Cold War. I think we're at the point now while we're making progress on those neglected tropical diseases and reducing the prevalence 30 to 40 percent, we're undergoing these big heroic shifts again, uh, which include, and I'm going to talk about some of those and what the impact is in terms of these diseases. It includes uh, a rise in anti-science that I want to talk about, horrific regional conflicts, uh, climate change. We've also seen now a retreat from globalization by our government, the United States government, as well as the UK government with Brexit. Uh, at the same time, China is doing just the opposite. They're expanding their global outreach through what some people call a Neo Silk Road Initiative or Belts and Road Initiative, and this concept of Blue Marble Health that I'll talk about. So what I'd like to do is now shift gears a little bit and say, okay, we've made progress to this package of medicines on neglected tropical diseases, but we're now about to embark on version 2.0. And what is version 2.0 look like. So version 2.0 says that you know, in a sense we're starting to play this game of global health whack-a-mole. What's whack-a-mole? It's that arcade game, right? You, you knock something down, you knock the, the head down, and then the other head pops up. Well, this is what I think we're doing. I think, you know, through this package of medicines and through our advocacy, we've knocked one head down, but now through these new forces of conflict, poverty, and climate change, we're starting to see the rise of a whole new group of neglected tropical diseases. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about. So I want to talk about conflict, poverty, and then, and then climate. So let's go to conflict first. One of the things that we did working with the Gates Foundation, actually it's not the Gates Foundation per se, it's, it's an institute that they created called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation based in Seattle, is we've, now that we've knocked down some of the neglected tropical diseases, we're trying to see what's left. And we looked at all the diseases and looked at the countries where their prevalence rates are the highest, and we noticed something very curious, which is that um, this is the countries color-coded by whether there are conflict, post-conflict nations or whether they're not. And you can see that the highest rates of the world's neglected tropical diseases are now in areas of political instability and conflict. 
And this is why it's so important to come to a place like Marion University, because you can't solve this problem with a medical school alone. You need arts and sciences. You need political science to help integrate that and help you figure out how to solve some of these problems. So conflict now has become a major driver of new driver, new 21st century driver of neglected tropical diseases. So a few years ago, I would spend the whole hour talking to you about poverty. Now I'm talking to you about conflict as well. Why conflict? Why is conflict, war, such a potent driver of tropical diseases? That's right. I don't know either, but um, but I think you can make some guesses. So let's let's look at some examples. What happened with Ebola in 2014? Why did Ebola rise out of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in 2014? What happened? Those countries were decimated by years or decades of atrocities and civil war. It collapsed their whole health system infrastructure, and it allowed Ebola to flourish. So this is happening again. It's happening here in the Middle East. So in Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, Yemen, we've suddenly seen now this dramatic rise in a whole host of diseases. It's not Ebola, but there are other diseases as well. We've seen the resurgence of measles and polio and all these other diseases that you've never heard of, like leishmaniasis and schistosomiasis and brucellosis. What's going on here? Well, we don't know for certain, but we think it's the collapse of the health system infrastructure stopping all public health control measures together with absence of clean water and sanitation, uh, all promoting. So this, this is now one of the big hot zones of the world's neglected tropical diseases is uh, the Middle East and North Africa. So let's take one of these diseases. Let's take this one, leishmaniasis which is a neglected tropical disease. This one looks like it's not, it's like lymphatic filariasis. It's not a killer disease, but it's highly disfiguring. It's transmitted by a sand fly that injects a parasite into the skin and causes an ulcerative disease of the skin and face. Uh, it's particularly devastating for girls and young women because as a result of this, they're rendered unmarriageable. It's grounds for spousal abandonment. Uh, it, it, it really destroys people's lives, not necessarily because it's a killer disease. The locals call it Aleppo evil uh, uh, for that reason. And so this is one of the terrible diseases arising out of the conflict zones. What's another place where we're seeing a lot of political instability now and conflict? How about in the Western Hemisphere? Any place in the Western Hemisphere where we're seeing a lot of disease now? Because of conflict? Well, let's take a step back. What's probably the most unstable country in, in the Western Hemisphere right now? Be yeah, Venezuela. So we're seeing now Venezuela 15, 20 years ago was the shining star of Latin America in terms of their ability to control their malaria, their Chagas disease, their schistosomiasis. It's all back, and now it's threatening the entire continent. Again, conflict. Uh, uh, or in uh, East Africa and South Sudan, we're seeing this massive rise in another form of leishmaniasis called Calazar, which produces a leukemia-like illness. So conflict, again, is one of the big drivers uh, that we're seeing. The other thing we've done now is to looking aside at the countries with the highest prevalence rates of the disease, countries with the largest total numbers of these diseases. And there we found something uh, very counterintuitive. So these are the countries in terms of total largest numbers of cases, not just prevalence rate, the highest percentage of people with disease, but the total numbers of cases. And we found something that's also a bit counterintuitive, which is the subject of my second forgotten book, um, which we call Blue Marble Health. And, and it goes like this, and it takes a minute to explain. When we talk, you know, in the past, when we've talked about neglected tropical diseases, we think of them as the poorest, most devastated countries of Africa, like Sudan, uh, like uh, Somalia, uh, like Central African Republic. But on a numbers basis, we found something really strange, which, and this partly is a consequence of the interventions that we've been interacting. What's left now is something quite interesting. When you look at the world's neglected diseases, 
like worm infections or leishmaniasis or tuberculosis or dengue or Chagas disease or leprosy, on the total numbers basis, overwhelmingly, they're in the G20 countries. What are the G20 countries? The 20 richest countries, the 20 largest economies. Wait a minute, you just told us these are poverty-related diseases. Why are they in the G20 countries? Well, it's the poor living among the wealthy in the G20 countries that's now accounting for all of these diseases, or is what, what I sometimes call the poorest of the rich. So what I've done here is draft uh, version 2.0 of the global health map. You know, we talk about global health, we always think of it as developing versus developed countries. What I'm not saying is the world has changed. All economies are rising, but lifting, uh, leaving behind a bottom segment of society. And what I'm showing you here are as a map of the hot spot areas of extreme poverty and diseases in the G20 countries, such as northern Argentina, uh, northeastern Brazil. Where did, where did Zika come out of? Northeastern, where in Brazil? Northeastern Brazil, and there's a reason, because that's the same place where Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, and dengue, and everything else is found as well. So it's something about these pockets of, of poverty uh, that are present. Um, uh, anything, you see anything weird here that sort of bothers you or troubles you? Yeah, the U.S., what's that about? Do we have poor people in the U.S.? Who knows? Uh, how many poor people do we have in the U.S.? Turns out that we have 20 million Americans that live in half the poverty level. And we have, according to the University of Michigan Center for Poverty, we have 1.65 million families that live on less than $2 a day. Uh, so about 5 or 6 million people. And they tend to be concentrated, particularly in the Gulf Coast states, so Texas, Louisiana, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, Florida. Uh, and, and so what we've done now is we've sort of done a deep dive to see, well, is that really the case? Can we really document that? So we've just finished uh, a large study in Alabama uh, to show that there's still widespread hookworm disease in the state of Alabama, in the poorest parts of rural Alabama. And this is in itself is an interesting story. What happened is there's an environmental activist by the name of Catherine Flowers, who's been working in a place called Lowndes County in Alabama, uh, much of her working life. She uh, heard me give a talk about diseases of poverty. She said, you know, I wonder if we have those diseases here. We, and Rahelia Mejia and my faculty went there and sure enough found a significant problem with hookworm disease in uh, rural uh, Alabama uh, or Texas. It turns out Texas has the largest number of people living in poverty of any state in the country. Now, there's great wealth in Texas, but again, this blue marble health concept, tremendous poverty along the border with Mexico. That's the lower left-hand picture there. Uh, but not only in the border with Mexico, but I'm showing you on the top are some pictures from poor neighborhoods in Houston. So a level of poverty that I never realized uh, existed uh, in, in the state of Texas. Uh, and, uh, and this was one of the reasons why I got so worried about Zika virus infection uh, hitting the state of Texas, because Zika is transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. That, that their favorite habitat are old discarded tires with a little bit of water. Anybody see some old discarded tires with a little bit of water? Yeah, so we uh, did a lot of advocacy to launch a major cleanup campaign in Texas uh, around this concept because there was all this tire dumping uh, in, in poor neighborhoods. And these are some new numbers of a paper that's going to come out at the end of this month on the number of people with neglected tropical diseases in the state of Texas. And the point is these are not rare diseases. They're incredibly common, but they're hidden. They're among the hidden poor, living in poor neighborhoods in Houston, living in poor neighborhoods along the border uh, with Mexico. And one of the big problems that we're having is getting people to care about them. Because one of the things that I've found uh, in, is that when we did our advocacy around the neglected tropical diseases of Texas, everybody was all in. Within a year, we had gotten $15 million appropriated by Congress. So I thought, 
boy, when we set up in Texas here and found widespread tropical infections among the poor in Alabama and Texas and elsewhere, wow, this thing will really take off. And actually quite the opposite has happened. It's been almost impossible to get anybody to care about neglected tropical diseases among impoverished Americans. Why is that? What's that? They don't vote? I'm, I'm actually genuinely asking. I don't know. This is why I'm, I'm here. I'm asking. I don't know the answer. They don't vote. What else might it be? They, they don't believe it? You know, one of the things that I've found, you know, going on CNN and MSNBC or Fox News, and I'm one of the few people that goes on both MSNBC and Fox News, and make sure you remember when you're on Fox News and when you're on MSNBC. You don't want to get, you don't want to get the two mixed up. You get to a lot of trouble otherwise. Um, is that, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's the far left or the far right people. What, what counts in this country is what affects people in Brookline, Massachusetts, Bethesda, Maryland, or Westchester, New York, and maybe Silicon Valley. What's, what's the common feature of those places? Affluent suburbs of East Coast, West Coast cities. So there's this wonderful book. I've forgotten the name of the author. She, she wrote a book called Flyover Nation. And I think she's onto something there that, you know, we, we're so obsessed on what's happening on the East Coast and the West Coast that we forget everything in the middle. And I think uh, this is an example of it. So what are we doing about this? Well, what we're trying to do and what I'm trying to do now is I'm not saying this is the whole answer, but we're trying to make vaccines for these diseases. Vaccines for these diseases that most of the big drug, drug companies are not interested in making. Why is that? There's no money. So the, 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 the example I've chosen to illustrate is a quote from David Letterman. I wanted some sage wisdom here. So David, this is what David Letterman uh, wrote at the height of the Ebola crisis. Uh, he wrote, he said on his show, Pepsi has a new Doritos flavored Mountain Dew. No, we don't have an Ebola vaccine, but we do have the Doritos flavored Mountain Dew. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant by that, my interpretation was, the technology to make the Ebola vaccine had actually been published in 2003 uh, in Nature magazine. Uh, but the technology sat there for a decade because no pharmaceutical company was interested in taking that technology licensing the technology and actually turning it around to a bottle of vaccine because this is Ebola was a disease of the poor. Nobody cared. What happened was things started looking pretty dire in 2014. You had uh, Ebola all over West Africa. There was worried about coming to Nigeria. If you remember, there were some Ebola cases in Dallas, Texas that I got involved with. And people started getting scared. So finally, the Obama administration put up $100 million dollars through something called BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, to incentivize drug companies to then turn around to the Ebola vaccine. And guess what? It worked. GlaxoSmithKline came on board, Merck came on board, Crystal came on board. They made that vaccine in record time, started testing it in West Africa. And then if you remember what happened was Ebola was gone because we accepted the U.S. Army, uh, other countries came in, they built a health system infrastructure, and Ebola had eventually vanished by putting in that health system, but not before 11,000 people died who didn't necessarily have to die if they had received the vaccine earlier. So it really shows that the problem is not just in the science of making a vaccine. We don't have the political, social, and financial instruments to actually figure out how to way to make these technologies accessible. Um, Professor Atlas is going to pay me for giving all these plugs for political scientists. I hope at the end of it. This is why we need political scientists. This is why we need economists. This is why we need soci sociologists. We need people to help us understand what are the barriers to this. We need smart people in business schools and law schools uh, to take this on. So what, so what did the world do? Well, Bill Gates and others got together at Davos for two years in a row. What's Davos? City of Switzerland, right? What, what did they host there? The World Economic Forum, right? And so they got together and they said, you know, enough of this. We're going to raise a fund. We're going to raise a global fund for vaccine development, which they called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. 
uh, and they aspired to raise $2 billion. They raised about $500 million. They got it from the Norwegian government, the Gates Foundation, others. But a good way to get started. My only concern is they chose as their first three targets uh, diseases of tremendous pandemic threat potential, but not diseases, true diseases of the poor. So they, they focused on things like MERS coronavirus and, and Nipah virus rather than diseases that we're talking about. But I think they have a good start. But what we've done is we've decided to set up what my kids like to call Dad's Guaranteed Money Losing Company, uh, which is based at the, the big research building of Texas Children's Hospital and the Texas Medical Center, where we're making now a portfolio of these vaccines, doing it in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I won't have a lot of time to go into the science. We try to use reverse vaccinology approaches. Maybe if we have time tomorrow with some of the students, we can go into this in a little more detail. So that we could do a whole hour lecture just on the science behind it. But these are some of our vaccines. We have a, we have a combined vaccine for schistosomiasis and hookworm infection in clinical trials in, in Gabon and Africa and Brazil. And this is, uh, these are recombinant approaches protein-based uh, vaccines, and we discovered this through uh, a high th moderate throughput approach using immunomics with a colleague of ours, uh, uh, Alex Lucas, who was with us in Washington. Now he runs his own laboratory in Australia. Uh, we can show that it's on the surface, and we can show that it, it induces an appropriate immune response. So we're making a lot of progress. One of the problems that we face is that we're having trouble with large-scale financing to get all the way to the goal line. So we can get from discovery through process development, manufacture phase one clinical trials, but then the amount of dollars you need to do the uh, pivotal third phase three clinical trials and industrial scale manufacturing, that one we're kind of getting uh, stuck on. And now we're working on a vaccine affecting the poor people in Texas. This is a disease called Chagas disease. It's a parasitic infection of the heart transmitted by kissing bugs that injects a uh, protozoan uh, organism. And this is where it's found. It's found in South Texas. But also we think it's spreading uh, along the Gulf Coast. So this is our first vaccine that we're actually making for people living in poverty in the United States. And we're collaborating with a Japanese company known as ASI to uh, to develop uh, this uh, vaccine. And all of our vaccines are funded in different ways. So the Gates Foundation helped us with our hookworm vaccine. Our schistosomiasis vaccine is funded by a couple of high net worth individuals together with the National Institutes of Health. Our Chagas vaccine is being supported by, of all people, the Japanese government. So I have to go back to Japan in a couple of weeks to ask for replenishment of funding. Also the Carlos Slim Foundation. Who's Carlos Slim? Mexican gazillion, right? Uh, so he's he's uh, he's uh, supporting us and his family, and we can show that the vaccine is blocking fibrosis in the heart. So we're getting very excited for this. Um, and then we're also uh, I have this role as Professor Atlas mentioned about my role as U.S. Science Envoy, and that was based on the realization that we can't make all these vaccines by ourselves. We have to start bringing on new partners to help us with this. And so what uh, Obama did back in 2009 was he went to Cairo and talked about reaching out to the Muslim world and the arts and sciences, and he created a program to send scientists like myself abroad to represent the U.S. government to show a different face of the U.S. So I took on this role as science envoy, and now we're working with the Saudi government to see if we can make that leishmaniasis vaccine that's arising out of the Middle East and the coronavirus virus vaccine as well. And this is our leishmaniasis vaccine that's targeting both the sand fly that's inducing that disfiguring lesion as well as the, the parasite as well. So that's making uh, quite a lot of progress as well. So it's not just what we make, but it's how we make. Yes, sir. Is poverty considered a treatable disease? Is poverty a treatable disease? Uh, I'd like to think so. I just can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> um, you know, that's that people often ask that. Well, why don't you address the root poverty rather than the diseases itself? And I think this is something that people at the World Bank and, and economists are, are really 
working very hard on uh, to try to address. But it's in some ways it's uh, even tougher than taking on some of these disease, tar disease targets as well. So we're taking on these vaccines that we're calling anti-poverty vaccines in, in, in the meantime. Yes, sir. So, so, so let me rephrase your question a little bit. That's, a, that's actually a very profound question, which is, what is it about poverty that causes these diseases? So, in some cases, first of all, it's understudied. We don't we don't have enough economists studying disease. But in some cases, it's inadequate housing. If, like, for instance, with Zika in Texas, people that don't have air conditioning, people that don't have window screens, so the mosquitoes could get in, or the environmental degradation around the house, the tire dumping. Uh, these are all important factors. Or poor sanitation, or a lack of access to clean water, a lack of access to medical care. We think all of these kind of create the perfect. I think all of them create the perfect storm to create these conditions. Now, the other big barrier that we're facing, aside from money, is this. Um, this other thing I talked about earlier, this rise in anti-science. Um, uh, there are enough people here who remember what a crummy disease measles is. Um, but there's, a, there's now a well-organized, substantially sized anti-vaccine groups that are trying to send false information that the vaccines are harmful and the diseases they prevent are actually good for you. So there's this book going around called Melanie's Marvelous Measles. It's a kid's book that tries to make the statement that measles is actually good for you, it boosts your immune system, ignoring the fact that before we started widespread vaccination, measles was the single leading killer of children uh, in the world. And we're in a situation now where we're seeing this very aggressive rise in an anti-vaccine movement that I partly blame us as scientists because, again, we're too focused on our grants and papers that we don't spend enough time addressing audiences like this and getting involved in public engagement. And my evidence for it is... Uh, a policy group based in D.C. called Research America that recently completed a survey and found that, indeed, 81% of Americans could not name a living scientist. And these those who could, Bill Nye, the science guy, was, you know, r ranking, ranking at the very top. And I've turned that around and said, you know, guys, this is our fault because we're so focused on the grants and papers that we don't think about blogging for the public or writing for the public. The Pew Foundation has found that fewer than 20% of scientists have ever blogged about their science, talk about their science on social media. How many of you are on Twitter? See, that's pathetic, right? So it's not just Twitter, right? It's, it's Facebook. It's every, everything else. We need to be more out there, I think. Uh, 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 and, and, and why do I say that? Well, what happened was while we're while we were making progress uh, on uh, vaccine development and on the package of medicines. Back in 1998, uh, Andrew Wakefield and his colleagues in the UK uh, wrote a paper that turned out to be phony, it's fake, uh, claiming that measles vaccine, particularly the measles component of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, caused autism. And this is the paper in The Lancet that uh, eventually got questioned in 2004 and got retracted in 2010. But over that 12-year period, there were a lot of people who erroneously believed that vaccines can cause autism or autism spectrum disorder. And this really, in the U.S. side, started in California, where there was a rise of what's called the anti-vax movement. Um, that particularly in around Orange County and Marin County in California. What what could you say about the two common features of Orange County and Marin County, California? Wealthy and educated, relatively educated. Educated enough to know how to do a Google search, but not enough to know what the hell they were looking at uh, when, when they did the Google search. And... Um, there was a sharp rise when parents started exempting their kids out of getting vaccinated because the state of California allowed non-medical uh, 
exemptions. Until 2015, 2016, there was a horrific measles epidemic that landed dozens of kids in the hospital. Uh, it was a very serious measles epidemic, and the California legislature said, oh my God, we've got to stop this nonsense, and they closed that loophole, and they stopped allowing non-medical exemptions or medical exemptions for reasons of personal belief or philosophical belief. And that was great. The problem was um, that then everybody moved to Texas. Um, and so Texas became the epicenter of the anti-vaccine movement in America. And I think part of it is the fact that Andrew Wakefield, after he left the United Kingdom, moved to Austin, Texas. And, um, and with it, this uh, a political action committee was formed known as Texans for Vaccine Choice. And the same time Wakefield and his colleagues directed and produced a pseudoscience documentary called Vaxxed from Cover Up to Catastrophe. Anybody see it? Anybody? It's hard to sit through. Anybody see the trailer? Just, you can just watch the trailer. And basically what it does is it shows kids on the autism spectrum at their worst, the most self-destructive behaviors. The voiceover comes on, this was caused by vaccines, and alleges this vast conspiracy for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control that they know this is happening and covering it up, which if you know anything about a federal agency, you realize if they, even if they wanted to cover it up, they could do it for all of about three hours. Yes. So how is he even legitimizing his claims? Because he is, you know, everybody knows what he did and it was falsified. So how is he claiming all of this now? And the answer is, I have no clue. I have no clue how he does this. <laughs> but this is what's happening. This with the, um, We've seen this massive rise in non-medical exemption. More than 50,000 kids in public schools are not getting vaccinated now. Um, and we don't even know about the homeschooled kids. So I've been writing about this and saying, you know what, we're going to start having measles epidemics in the state of Texas. And the reason I focus on measles tends to be, and it's really all the childhood infectious diseases, but measles in particular because it's so highly transmissible. And as vaccine coverage rates go down, that's often the first breakthrough uh, infection uh, that you see. And if, to make matters worse, Wakefield and his colleagues are going, are being predatory on other communities. They're going into the Somali immigrant community in Minnesota. They convince them that vaccines cause autism. They drop vaccine coverage to 40%. And now the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul is just getting out of the shadows of a terrible measles outbreak, causing 80 kids and 20 kids uh, uh, in, in the hospital. Uh, and then he's teamed up with Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. Um, you know, the guys with the bow ties, not this kind of bow tie, but the, the other kind of bow tie, and going into African-American communities and claiming that vaccines are the next Tuskegee-like experiment on people. And so now they're dropping coverage there. So this is a very aggressive and uh, effective movement. And so we've been charting this now. These are the rise in non-medical exemptions in the 18 states that allow it. And these are some of the hot spots counties now, hotspot cities uh, that we're seeing associated with, with large numbers of kids not getting vaccinated. And, and the anti-vaccine movement tends to come in different flavors. So up in the Pacific Northwest, up in Kings County, which is Seattle or Portland, uh, it tends to be coming more from the political left, sort of peace, love, granola. We have to be careful what we put into our kids. And, but in Texas, it's kind of interesting. They've adopted the language of the Tea Party movement to say that's a civil liberties issue. You can't tell us what to do with our kids. Well, of course we tell you what to do with your kids. You tell them you have to, if you drive your child in a car, it has to be in a car seat or a seatbelt, or if you own a gun, you have to keep your gun locked. But but that's that. these are the arguments that we're, we're using. So I'm very worried uh, about this rise. So we've been sort of fighting back, and then I just had a paper on JAMA Pediatrics showing how quickly measles can get a foothold as does that vaccine coverage uh, rates start to drop. And this is a study from Heidi Larson's group at the University of London, who's now finding evidence that our American anti-vaccine movement is spreading globally. So just like, you know, the U.S. exports its culture, right? We export Hollywood movies, we export rock, rock stars, we export fast food, we're exporting this garbage now also. So France is not getting vaccinated. Italy's not getting vaccinated. Croatia's not getting vaccinated. So my worry is, what happens when this starts moving into Nigeria or Brazil, you know, the BRICS countries, India? This could, we could start reversing the sustainable 
development goals and the Millennium Development Goals. So I decided to fight back, and my role is not only as a vaccine scientist, but as Professor Atlas mentioned, I have my uh, youngest daughter, Rachel, as an adult with severe autism and other mental disabilities. And I wrote this piece in the New York Times last year, which the Times editor gave at the title How the Anti-Vaxxers Are Winning. And that's been interesting because uh, I went from being beneath contempt to being totally contemptible by the anti-vaccine group. So they've been very aggressive uh, with me. And I will, we'll talk a little bit about that. And in the, in the arguments I've been using, I wrote a series of articles now, sh uh, which actually does a study of the literature, clearly showing there's no link between MMR vaccine or thimerosal in vaccines or any other component of vaccines and autism. That's pages and pages of papers uh, documenting that. But I also point out the plausibility, that's me with Rachel there, showing now that you can show that the changes in the brains of kids with autism are actually happening in the first trimester of pregnancy uh, well before kids ever see vaccines. And uh, I don't know how much you want to go into it, but uh, this is a little complicated. I'll just spend one minute on this slide. There's been some fascinating work now about uh, kids on the autism spectrum. And this group by uh, uh, Joe Piven at the University of North Carolina who can show that usually the clinical expression of autism happens around 18 months of age, 20 months of age, and then parents remember that's when their kids got vaccinated, and that's when they'll often uh, try to erroneously make the link. But he, and he can show that around this time, that clinical expression of autism correlates with an, a massive expansion of brain volume, as shown by MRI. But he could show that those changes in the brain are actually happening as, as early as six months of age, well before they ever show manifestations of autism. And now you can do an MRI at six months of age and predict which kids are going to go on to develop autism. And now the group at UCSD in, in San Diego has shown that you can show these changes back, go all the way back to... Uh, the first and the second trimester of pregnancy because it's a genetic and epigenetic condition. Um, so we're trying to try to use two parts to the argument. One, showing the evidence that vaccines don't cause autism, but also the second piece, this lack of plausibility based on what we know about the genetics and epigenetics of autism. Any biology majors here, or biochemistry majors? Try explaining epigenetics to a lay audience. I dare you, right? You start talking about non-coding RNAs, DNA methylation, histone modification, you lose people quickly. So I'm just, we still have to fine-tune that message. And so this is uh, and this is how the anti-vaxxers go after me. They, they call me the boy who cried wolf because I'm exaggerating measles. At least they show a picture when I was younger, so that was, that's nice. Uh, I, I like this one. Um, and this sort of gives you this political right flavor in Texas. Wants vaccine mandates, a post-travel ban to Somalia during Somali-Minnesota outbreak. That's how we have to do it. We have to block immigration from Somalia. Well, this is interesting. Well, this is a sanctuary city. I guess Houston's a sanctuary city. So maybe just, I don't know. Uh, denial of vaccines cause autism. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it goes on and on. But again, it's this rise in anti-science that we're often uh, too silent about. So I know I've gone longer than I should. Uh, I'll end here with a quote from Ellie Wiesel, who once said, man's weakness is not in achieving victories, but in taking advantage of them. We've had victories, right? We've, uh, through a mass drug administration, this rapid impact package, we've knocked down NTDs 30 to 40 percent, only to allow conflict and blue marble health and climate change to allow them to start drifting back in a new group of diseases, or great progress in vaccinating the world's children, only to allow a ridiculous pseudoscience anti-vaccine movement to take hold and reverse our gains. So we have to figure out a way to stop the self-inflicted wounds. And again, this is why we need our social scientists to work together with the biomedical scientists to solve these problems. So I'll stop there. Maybe time for a couple of questions. Maybe thank you so much for, for staying so late and coming out in the front. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it is nice. Okay. Has the uh, incidence of autism really increased, or is it because it's being diagnosed earlier? Clearly. It's not just being diagnosed earlier, it's being diagnosed at all. So, you know, what we used to call things like mental retardation, 
or intellectual disabilities, we're now putting those kids, they're saying they're on the autism spectrum. So we've enormously widened the diagnostic category. So I think the vast majority, so when people talk about an autism epidemic, I'm not Personally, I'm not convinced, we don't know for sure, but I'm personally not convinced there is a true autism epidemic. There's a uh, change in diagnostic categories and calling things autism that we never called autism before. And the numbers are going to go up even more because now there's some fascinating new literature coming out on girls with autism. You know, we used to say autism was nine to one boys to girls, nine to one boys to girls. And now we realize that autism in girls is probably much more common than we previously realized, in part because girls are much more sociable than boys are. Who knew? Um, and, and so if they, can ma they can camouflage it. They can mask their autism better. But what we're seeing in these girls with autism is very high rates of, of comorbidities, like obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, eating disorders, bulimia. So there's some who believe that a lot of the girls that we know with bulimia, eating disorders, OCD are actually on the autism spectrum. It's really very fascinating. It's all, all it's rapidly shifting. So what that means that as we start diagnosing girls with autism, the numbers are going to double again. It's not that there's a true change. It's just that the numbers are going up. Yes. I'm a social scientist, and I was interested in what you were talking about as a social scientist. It started with the association with Christian countries, particularly Catholicism, continued on with countries with high conflict rates, and I'm wondering what you're saying, is there a causal link here, an association that we should pay attention to, or exactly what is it that you're seeing is significant about that? Right. So it's, it's a great question. So clearly there's an association, but here again, we need social scientists to figure out what's, what's cause, what's effect, what's true, true, and unrelated. We clearly, I mean, there's clear, there's a clear link between poverty and neglected tropical diseases. Uh, and, it, and I think the equation works both ways. I think, uh, impoverished conditions promote neglected tropical diseases for some of the reasons we've been talking about, but I also think NTDs reinforce poverty because they make two people too, too sick to go to work, affect shaving IQ points off of kids like hookworm does and affecting pregnancy outcomes. So I think the link between poverty and neglected tropical diseases is pretty clear. Um, but let's talk about some of the others. So the Catholicism, well, it's clearly not Catholicism per se. It's the fact that if you look at where the, the Catholic, my opinion is the Catholic majority countries in sub-Saharan Africa, like Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Angola, or in Asia, like Papua New Guinea or Philippines, these are impoverished countries. So I think probably the link operates through poverty as well. Um, with conflict, I think there may be a component of poverty, but I think it's collapse of health in, health system infrastructure. But the amount of data that we've collected on this is, you know, close to, to zero uh, because nobody looks, nobody funds social scientists to really look at this thing. So this is going to be, this is the next frontier, I think. Yes. Uh, there we go. Is there any relationship, this is out on a limb, between childhood depression and poverty? Um, well, there's, there's, I will defer to the social scientist, um, but there's clearly, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence, the latter, showing that poverty can promote depression and, and anxiety and, and stress in childhood, which has a number of consequences. But I won't, I won't, I don't want to go too far out of my lane and, and, and venture into the other stuff. Yes. So um, along with poverty um, affecting the neglect, neglected tropical diseases, do you think um, just the weather of the area that these exist in, like the tropical weather plays a major role in these? And how, like it 
do you think that this is going to be a major hurdle to cross over because it's just out of our control to eradicate or at least reduce the number of these people that suffer from these diseases? Well, um, you asked about five questions here. Let me see if I can parse it out a little, uh, a little bit. I mean, in terms of the link with poverty and weather, you know, if you've ever listened to Al Gore speak about climate change, he's very eloquently points out how climate change and extreme weather events disproportionately affect people living in poverty, for example. They, they tend to be uh, uh, the most vulnerable. So I do think there is, I do think the two reinforce each other. But for instance, I have a paper in the Public Library of Science uh, the neglected tropical diseases of the uh, Canadian Arctic. Um, and now they're clearly not tropical, but they're clearly linked to poverty. So I think poverty tends to be the, the big determinant. And, and the idea that I'm pushing and promoting is that while we wait for poverty reduction measures, we can still do a lot to mitigate against these diseases by making vaccines that indirectly will help lift people out of poverty, and therefore I call them anti-poverty vaccines. Yes? Uh, with regard to the NTDs, where you were saying that some are on track to possibly be eradicated and some seem to be recurrent, have you found any factors that seem to make a particular disease one way or the other? Yeah, the, the, uh, what seems to be the most predictive is if the intervention can interrupt transmission, not just reduce morbidity and mortality, but actually stop transmission of the diseases. So mass drug administration with either ivermectin or diethylcarbamazine citrate for lymphatic filariasis actually seems to reduce the reservoir population of parasites and actually stops transmission. Same in many cases with river blindness or with trachoma or yaws. So if your intervention can also stop transmission, that, that takes you pretty far along from that standpoint, as with some of the vaccines. Just like smallpox vaccine eradicated smallpox because it stopped transmission. Yes? So this is somewhat similar to Dr. Akbar's question, but when you're having a discussion with an anti-vaxxer and you point out the fact that Dr. Wakefield's paper, which is pretty much their one and only source to go off of, when you point out to them how it's been retracted and when you point out things like thimerosal and elemental mercury are not the same thing and they have very different characteristics, yet they, they just flat out deny what you said, where, where do you go from there? Well, you know, when, when, like you talk, your head when you the talk to anti-vaccine groups or parents or audiences, I find about 60 to 70 percent are not really dug in. They've just read garbage on the internet, you know, like the national, they've, and, they, and, and to their defense, the websites have seemingly innocuous names, like there's the National Vaccine Information Center, which is really the National Vaccine Misinformation Center. But, you, you know, unless you really know that, you might not know it. Uh, or the age of autism, you know, and these kinds of things. So, and those parents, the 60 to 70 percent, you could sit down with them, rationalize, and make them understand because they've heard something unsavory about vaccines from their relatives or friends. Then there's another 10 to 20 percent that are really dug in, and they've, they They've tied it up with their whole personal belief system. They've tied their identity to it, um, and they're really tough. And they also believe in conspiracy theories, and the fact that you're trying to talk them out of it means that, therefore, you must be part of the conspiracy. Uh, so so that, that's really tough. Uh, and so I'm, I've just uh, finished writing a, my third forgotten book, uh, which is called, which has the working title, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, uh, which uh, is going to be published by Johns Hopkins Press, like Blue Marble Health, and it'll come out probably summer, fall. And the, it, it kind of takes, does a chapter describing what it's like to be parents of uh, now an adult with, with autism, uh, but also all of the evidence showing that there is no link. So it kind of alternates chapters. I think it's a pretty powerful book, and we'll see. We'll see how see if it makes an impact. 